By now, you've heard about Global Poker, one of the fastest growing online card rooms available in the US and Canada today. So what's stopping you from trying it out? Global Poker is a safe and secure social poker site that uses their own patented sweepstakes model. Signing up is easy. You can use Google, Facebook, or just an email address. You can always play for free on Global Poker, but you can also buy gold coins for additional play, which will earn sweeps coins that can be redeemed for real cash to a bank account, Skrill account, or even as a gift card. Get a free 5,000 gold coins when you sign up right now at GlobalPoker.com. Poker Stories is an audio series that features casual interviews with some of the game's best players and personalities. Each episode highlights a well-known figure in the poker world and dives deep into their favorite tales, both on and off the felt. Hello and welcome to Poker Stories, a podcast brought to you by Card Player, the Poker Authority, and hosted by me, Julio Rodriguez. We've got a great one for you this time with episode number 124 featuring Josh Arie. Now, Josh is probably best known for getting a lot of TV time during his third place finish in the 2004 WSOP main event, where he won $2.5 million. But he was not a product of the poker boom, as Josh was already making trips from his home in Atlanta to Las Vegas for the series back in 1999 when he won his first bracelet. He continued to travel the circuit for several years and racked up many notable finishes, including a third place finish in the World Poker Tour Borgata Poker Open, a runner-up finish in the WPT 5 Diamond World Poker Classic at Bellagio, and his second WSOP bracelet. Then about 10 years ago, Aria retired from full-time play. He still made the trip to the series and still made some final tables, but didn't want to devote as much time to the grind. That all changed this year when Josh found himself squarely in the hunt for the World Series of Poker Player of the Year race. When all was said and done, Josh cashed a total of 12 times with 7 top 10 finishes and 2 more bracelets for his collection. He final tabled the online high roller, the pot limit Omaha high roller, and the $50,000 Poker Players Championship, and then managed to win the $1,500 PLO and the $10,000 PLO 8 or better event cashing for nearly $1.2 million and bringing his lifetime totals to more than $9 million. As a result of his stellar series, Josh narrowly beat out both Daniel Negreanu and Phil Hellmuth for Player of the Year honors. We definitely talked about those accomplishments, uh, but Josh also has some great stories away from the circuit, like how he got his start in the gambling world, betting his allowance at the local pool hall before he could even drive or the time he won a six-figure pot off a former NBA player Antoine Walker, or even his miserable day playing golf and poker with one Michael Jordan. That's right, I said Michael Jordan. That's enough intro. Here is my conversation with Josh Arie. I'm here with the one and only Josh Arie. How are you doing, Josh? I'm doing great, man. A little wore out, but I'm surviving. Yeah, I was going to ask you about your plans coming into this series. Obviously, everyone who's listening now at home knows you are the player of the year for the World Series of Poker in 2021. Congratulations, by the way. <laughs> Huge accomplishment. It, uh, it's, it's pretty cool. Like I used to I used to think I had the chance at player of the year. Um because I do play all the games or think I play all the games. Um, but over the past few years, I really stopped trying. Like that wasn't, that wasn't one of my goals. It was, I didn't want to make it a goal when uh, it wasn't a realistic goal. Right. And I mean, I, I'm sure even you halfway through your run this year realized just how much more work is involved than you really thought i mean once you start going from tournament to tournament to tournament you know just late raging everything it's kind of a never-ending uh story right yeah it was uh it was definitely grueling um i i wasn't focusing on it at all until when i won the second bracelet 
and then I started seeing that like I was right behind at the at that time Jake was leading the leaderboard and I was just behind him and I was like wow well the series is halfway over and if I'm ever going to win it this is my chance yeah so <laughs> I think it was either the next day um I decided to play the online event which I never would have played I'm a horrible online player and ended up getting fourth in that which made me at I passed Jake at the time and that's when it started to get real it's like holy shit this is this is a hell of a chance that I have um so yeah that's when I started to really uh overload my schedule and i was playing 14 hours a day every day from there <laughs> brutal brutal but worth it and, and you know it turns out you needed pretty much all of those points uh yeah. towards the end there was you know it came down to the last day somebody could have caught you um yeah. i want to talk about that but first i want to go back to the beginning as we do on this show um you know obviously people know you as well, they call you Atlantic Josh, but you were born in Rochester, New York, right? <laughs> yeah, I, my uh, my dad uh, met my mother. My dad was serving. My dad's from Israel, and he was serving in the Israeli army. And my mother was, uh, I believe, at uh, University of Jerusalem. Uh, so they met there, and after. After the Israeli army, my dad moved to the U.S. to get married, and so we lived in Rochester, New York, for I think the first eight years of my life. I'm pretty sure it's either it's either eight or nine, and uh, then my dad moved to Atlanta, getting a job, um, and I've lived here ever since. This was uh, you and you had two siblings, right? Yeah, I have an older brother and a younger sister. So. The story on you is that you were a little bit of a, a wayward youth. You started playing pool very early, betting your allowance before you could even drive. Is this all true? Yeah, I used to. When I, I think the the earliest I remember gambling was, I think I was in eighth grade, and I used to cut grass a lot, and and I was always independent, making my making my own money. But I would cut grass to buy like the nicer clothes that my dad couldn't afford. And when I was in eighth grade, a bunch of kids would we would all spend the night at one guy's house and he had a pool table. And I lost all the nice clothes that I had purchased for myself playing pool in eighth grade. And then I just started. um going to the pool halls and there was a pool hall within walking distance of my house. And I would just try to make like five bucks so I could buy a pack of cigarettes and a 40 ounce beer in like ninth grade. <laughs> Thinking back, that's pretty stupid. But yeah, um, I've been gambling since really young. Man, these are some pretty cutthroat kids taking the the shirt off your back. You know what I mean? Oh man, I'll never forget it. It was it was it was before. There's a brand called J Crew, and nowadays they have stores like in the mall. And every time I see it, it just brings back horrible memories. But back then, it was catalog purchase only, and I still remember the pullover hoodie that I paid like eighty dollars for. And freaking, yeah, I lost it to the guy. I had a, a nice leather wallet. I lost that. And it was, yeah, it was definitely, uh, I definitely didn't enjoy see him wearing my jacket to school. Ooh, that's got to be tough. Uh, there's also a story here that says that your dad had to come bail you out when the cops raided the pool hall. Yeah, we were playing, I was playing $2 a game. Um, and it was in a really bad area so um the there was the fulton county drug police which is the city of atlanta drug police called red dogs and they're casing the place because there's drug dealers around there whatever and i i guess i was playing one of the drug dealers that they were uh 
that they were watching. And the guy put $2 in the pocket because I had beat the guy and we were playing $2 a game. And I reach in the pocket and get the money. And then, and I look up and there's badges in, in my face. And I think I was 14, maybe 15 at the time, but they made a big scene out of it just because they wanted everybody to be known that they were there and whatever. And they had me up again. The, the storefront was a glass storefront and they had me up against the wall for a good 20 minutes and they made me call my dad and my dad had to come pick me up. And I mean, he was pissed, but he was, he knew what I was doing. He knew that I played pool for money and he knew where he always knew where I was at. So, I mean, the it was my high school was very like, there was a lot of drugs and a lot of drinking and that just, it, I never really enjoyed being drunk or being high. Uh, so I just, gambling was my thing and he was okay with it to a point. But you know, when he's getting calls at 11 o'clock at night to come pick up your 14 year old, uh, because to keep him from going to jail for gambling, I'm sure he wasn't too happy about that. Now, was it the gambling that you were attracted to, or was it the billiards, or was it just for being... me? It's it's neither. If for me, it's the competing. Like, there's something weird wired in me that started as a kid, and I, I've done a lot of psychological work to figure this out. And as a kid, my dad was a single dad raising three kids, so. His attention, like it was his time was thin. He was working full time job and trying to raise three kids. And I as a kid, the only time that my dad would really get to come spend time with me was when I made the all stars in baseball. So I became very competitive. And it was like for me, I wanted to make sure that I made all stars because I knew my dad would come. Um, so just. I've always been wired to be very competitive and that was just another way for me to be competitive. Um, it just made me winning makes me feel good, I guess. Um, and that's, it's, it's, it's weird. It's not normal how good winning makes me feel and how bad losing makes me feel. Um, right. I they always say that, uh, losing, Winning never feels as good as as uh, losing feels bad, right? Right, right. As I've gotten older, I've uh, learned to take losses um, as lessons. Yes, it still hurts, but it's necessary to be good at whatever you do. Um, otherwise, you'd never learn. Or otherwise, I'd never learn. Um, if I succeeded every single time, I would think I do everything perfect. And so, so you need losses to make the wins feel good. But yeah, that's like, so it, it's never been the gambling. It's just been competing makes me feel, uh, I, I, I it's just a huge rush. It's, it's competing is my drug. Uh, before we find uh, poker, where, what was your biggest game you ever played uh, in pool? Were you hustling people or was this just more like a, no, let's I've see never who I could be? No, I've never been like the hustling type. I've always wanted money now. I've never like dumped money off to somebody today to beat him out of more tomorrow. Uh, I've just always wanted to win the max possible at the time being. Um, and I've just, I, I, I always, I've wanted to give people like a fair shake. So it's, 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 the hustling wasn't my thing. Um, I've played for a lot of money. Um, I'm not going to say <laughs> I've played for a lot of money. Uh, me and JRB, even, have, even as a teenager. Oh no. As a teenager, um, I, when I was 16, there was this guy that had a taco stand at the pool hall and he liked to gamble. And when I was 16, we would play a lot. And one time we ended up playing for like a hundred dollars a game. And I remember going and telling my friend John that, uh, if we ever get up $600, let me know when we're stopping. 
Well, at the time he wouldn't tell me, but at the time we were up like twelve hundred dollars. He was backing me. <laughs> and I end up losing a little bit back, but I think at sixteen, I think the most money I had won was about a thousand dollars. Um when I was nineteen, I beat a guy out of like fifteen thousand. Um but yeah, that's and and at at 19 and having $15,000, literally, like, I thought I was never going to be broke ever again. Like, I, <laughs> I would always go from, I would always go from, I would get some job, keep it for two weeks, get a paycheck, go gamble, and think that I was never going to be broke again. Like, I, I, in my mind, I always thought I was going to win, even when I'm getting crushed, like, I just, I, I've always done a good job about it's, and it's a fault, but I've done a good job about keeping like positive thoughts going through my mind that I'm going to win. You're going to win. But sometimes that works against you and uh, you don't end up winning. I want to get back to those jobs you mentioned, but first, what's this JRB story you're about to talk? Tell us. <laughs> <to. laughs> me, and, me and JRB, we've tangled a lot at the pool, on the pool table. We've probably, I mean, we, we've we easily spent 300 hours together on a pool table, um, and we've played for some ridiculous amounts that uh, I'm not proud of, um, <laughs> stupid, like stupid, stupid amounts, as you can imagine, the way that, the way that he likes to gamble, and if I think that I have an edge, I'll gamble pretty good myself. But yeah, he, there was definitely there was definitely uh, new cars on the line every game. It's <laughs> a pretty stupid amount. Is he one of the better players out there? I know Daniel used to play back in the day as well. Um, yes, I would say. Well, the best pool player, uh, out of all the poker players, is by far Nick Schulman. Like Nick Schulman is it's crazy how talented this guy is at whatever he does um john yeah, him and john hannigan right yeah johnny world he's a stud too um jrb and i were really really close uh when it comes to uh the most popular gambling game is one pocket um and we're really close. I'm a hair better, possibly, if we're playing like on neutral ground. Um, but I, I mean, I'm sure I'm missing some. Daniel just doesn't really play anymore. And Daniel grew up like in a snooker background. And if if Daniel had kept playing, he would probably crush all of us at snooker. But that's a dumb Canadian game. <laughs> um, <laughs> but... Um, no, it's, it's snooker is just not popular in the U S so, uh, yeah, it's, uh, so none of us really ever played it. Um, but yeah, I, I'm sure there's some other pool players. Ben lamb plays a little bit. Um, he, he's not bad. Um, I, I'm drawing blanks, but yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's mainly, gotta be it's, Nick, Nick and Johnny, right? Well, it's just, it's, it's Nick. Johnny Hennigan is like, uh, I don't know. He's a specialist in this one certain game, but he's still really good. But he's like a true specialist in this one game called back pocket eight ball or nine ball or something. But he's still, I mean, he's definitely a really good player. But John Hennigan, I mean, uh, Nick Schulman is a strong, strong player at all games. He's, uh, he's, he's just really talented. I have like a man crush on him. <laughs> You're not the only one. Uh, yeah, let's no, talk no. about poker. Uh, did, did you discover poker in these pool halls? Yeah, we, so we, we, we were regulars at this one pool hall. And when I was about 18, every, Every time the pool hall would close, the bartender would deal poker to everybody, and he would play and deal as well. And I would see these people that were the tightest pool gamblers 
ever just giving their money away, losing all their money playing poker. And the math behind it was always pretty simple to me. Um, so I was able to think outside the box and figure a few things out. And I just thought that eventually it was like I was sitting around the pool hall, not gambling, just waiting for this poker game. And uh, from there, I found a few of the smaller home games around Atlanta. And then um, it got to be where I would build up a 2000 or even like a thousand dollar bankroll. And I would go down to the Grand Casino in Biloxi with my brother's fake ID and go broke quite often, but left there like really wanting to be good enough to play with these people in the casino. And uh, eventually I was able to, you know, my stays would go from 24, 48-hour sessions in the poker game and going broke and coming home, it would turn into, well, I would be able to last for a couple weeks before I went broke. Um, but then eventually, uh, I just learned more and more and more. Poker really interested me in back in the day because the mathematics behind like the foundation of poker skill is always going to be mathematics, but then you mix that in with people skills and understanding how to manipulate people's attitude or not attitudes, but perception of me. Um, and I just understood the, the people part behind live poker, which you, helped, uh, it really, it really helped me improve fastly. Uh, it really helped me improve pretty quickly, uh, in the early days. You did go to college for a year, and I know you worked as a courier for a little while. Uh, did you drop out for poker, or was it just not for you? Well, I, both. I mean, it's, I was really bad at school. I was, I was never interested. I was always um, wanting to be somewhere else, and that the old hustler mentality of wanting money now was it 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 carried over into school where I started thinking, well, if I can get a job making 500 bucks a week now, why the hell do I want to go to school and wait to possibly get a job later? So I yeah. would, um, if I ever had 500 bucks in my pocket, I truly believed in my mind that I don't need school and I'll never be broke again. Um, so I would, I quit school and I would just go between probably 10, 15 different jobs that lasted a week, you know, where I got <laughs> one paycheck and quit. We have a question here. We asked people, what was the worst job you ever had before poker? Oh man. Um, probably I remember I was doing telemarketing for a vacation company hmm. and I, I was like selling Disney vacations and the first I feel like they set me up or something because like the first day I think I sold three vacations and I made like $80 each and then I worked there for like another two weeks and never sold another one <laughs> um, so yeah, I think I was telemarketing was always was always rough just sitting there and just having people yell at you and hang up the phone on you and that was pretty rough. They set you up with some plants in the beginning. Yeah. Build up that confidence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh okay, well I think a lot of people incorrectly assume that you made your debut in the two thousand four main event. Uh but you'd already been around for almost a decade before that. Um you made the the trip out in 96 for the first time? No, no. My first World Series was 99. Oh, okay. That was the year yeah, you won your bracelet. My, yeah, my last job was in 98. I stopped. I quit working when I was in 98, and I was hustling cards around Atlanta. I was playing cards in home games two or three nights a week, and I was dealing two nights a week. And my first poker trip was to Philadelphia. 
my first tournament trip as an unemployed uh, poker player um, <laughs> was in January of 99. And I did really good. Like I satellited in the main event was like a 1K and I satellited in for $90 and then I final tabled that. And then a couple months later, I went out to the World Series and I won the second tournament I played. And I think I won like 200,000 or something. And I was 24 years old at the time. And 20, me at 24 with 200,000 was uh, a very scary uh, <laughs> thought that I had that much money at 24. Um, but yeah, 99 was my first World Series. So before we get into your personal accomplishments, what was poker like back then? Because this is pre-boom, right? You didn't get into it because you saw Moneymaker on TV. So uh, you're there before it's in fashion. Um, yeah. I talked to some people who were around at that time, and they were saying that the games were kind of dying out a little bit towards uh, 2000 and beyond. Um, I don't think dying out. I think uh, it was a very niche, niche, or I don't niche thing. Um, there was a lot of personality. Uh, it it attracted the more kind of degenerate gambler rather than rather than the you know typical smart guy right now that looks at you know, their ROI and their hourly and charts and all that stuff. It was more of like someone that likes to gamble. There's more sports bettors at the tables than there were college students. I mean, it's, uh, Got it. it was, it was just, it was another form of gambling. Um, and there was a lot of personalities back then. It was before the days of hoodies and backpacks and, it just hadn't evolved eventually. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with smart people playing poker. It was, it was inevitable that people would get into it and dissect it the way that it's been solved and figured out. Uh, but back then, um, I just, uh, it was just a different, different group of people. Uh, not in a bad way or in a good way. It's just, you know, it's, it's more of like a fun thing to do. Were you accepted right away or did it take you a while to break in with with everyone? Um, I don't know. I, uh, yeah, yeah, I don't know. I, I've never really worried about being accepted. Um, so I don't know. I, I think I was accepted. I never looked at it that way. I mean, I, I always had friends like there was, sorry, there's some yard work going on right outside. Um, <laughs> you know, at the time there was a lot of people my age, uh, coming onto the professional circuit. There was me and Daniel Negranu. And there was Phil Ivey, we're all about the same age, and John Juwanda and Alan Cunningham. I remember one time in the year 2000, uh, one of the biggest uh, online poker, you know, there was a site called Poker Pages, and the owner was Mark Napolitano. And mm -hmm. he had this idea to have a team Poker Pages. And in the year 2000, it was me, Daniel, Alan Cunningham, Phil Ivey, and John Juwanda sitting, <laughs> like having a meeting at a poker table. And Mark was wanting to put this poker pages team together. And since then, I'm the least accomplished out of the whole crew. Uh, but if you put up those stats that were, if you put up all the, uh, accolades and accomplishments that that table has accrued through the years it's pretty phenomenal yeah it's pretty good company right there for sure yeah for sure i don't mind being so, at the bottom of that totem pole at all you uh 
Obviously, you won your first bracelet in 99, 3K limit hold'em. The next year, you finished runner-up in the 1500 PLO to Johnny Champ, which yeah. must have been pretty cool. Yeah, um, pretty cool. He really, like, he completely abused me at that. <laughs> it was, like, I was left in shock on what happened to me there. The uh, It must have been a bigger shock when... All the masses came in, though, after Moneymaker, right? Yeah, it was pretty cool. Like, it was um, it was pretty awesome being able to understand. See, at that point, I hadn't played much No Limit. And this was the new craze. So No Limit was fairly new to me as well. I was always uh, a Limit Hold'em player and a Pot Limit Omaha player. Um, so, but this new craze was all about no limit, and I was not good at all. And so there was a learning curve for me as well. But the new people that were coming into play were very new. And yeah. so we were able to, like, if you had any background in poker at in the 2003-2004 time, you were really able to uh, to do some good. And uh, I was just fortunate with my timing in 2004 that I went on a good run at the right time and uh, it, it and put me to where I am today. Yeah, they, uh, you obviously finished third in the main event for two and a half million dollars. Um, I'm, in some ways, I'm sure you didn't like the way you were portrayed on that broadcast, but I'm sure it also gave you a level of notoriety that you might not have had otherwise for, you know, a typical third place finisher. Um, have you thought about that at all? Or yeah, it's funny. Like, we actually, uh, my girlfriend had never seen it, and we we actually watched it the other night. And I look back, and it's fucking bad. I mean, it's like wow look at me go. I mean, it was, you know, in, in my defense, which is not that much of a defense because I look back at that guy and I'm like, wow, he's a dick. Um, I came from the pool room where everybody is fighting tooth and nail for every dollar. And that was me fighting tooth and nail for every dollar, not caring about anything, you know, not competition isn't personal like yes there's bad sportsmen and there's lines that you cross that shouldn't be crossed but i'm playing for my life um before that time i you know in in 1999 when i won 200,000 i was broke 3 months later like i was literally i i bought a new car and i went to carmax 2 weeks later to to sell my car that I had bought. So I've never really had money. And all I think is I see $5 million up top and this is my life that I'm playing for. Um, um, I, and that's not a valid, uh, that's not an excuse for my attitude and the things that I did. But I'm a competitor at nature, and when I'm competing, I don't really care about uh, – it's not personal. I don't care about uh, what you think of me. Um, I just – I don't know. The pool room came out of me. I, I handle it different now because it's not so – every time I sit at the table, my whole life isn't on, on the line. Um, if I were – if my life was on the line of the table, that same person might come out again. Uh, but every one of my friends knows and anybody that knows me in life knows that I'm a caring person and that I'll do anything for anybody that I'm close to. So what people that I'm not close to think about me doesn't matter to me. Um, but yeah, I look back at that person and I'm like, holy shit, that fucking kid is an asshole. Um, <laughs> I think you're being a little hard on yourself because I look back no, at that and I go, it, no, I, I, know, I understand, you know, it's you and you, you're probably cringing at, at your own self. But from an outsider's perspective, I mean, 
you know, Phil did a whole lot worse this this fall, um, and and managed to walk away unscathed. Uh, I think it, I don't, given I don't, the circumstances, really, it's not that bad. Outside of the skill level, I don't want to. I don't want being being compared to Phil on a personal <laughs> level isn't isn't really a high bar. Um, but no, I I love Phil. Phil's a great person, and yes, he's super competitive, and it comes out in bad ways. Uh, and that's basically what it was back then. I was super competitive playing with in my mind at the time my life is on the line so what you think about me doesn't matter and i'm going to belittle you um at whatever cost and that's my thought process then i don't feel the same way now i try to be more respectful to people and try to um try to use like a life philosophy at the table as well. I want to be respected and I want to respect people. But at, at 29 years old with millions of dollars on the line, um, that didn't matter to me. Uh, you didn't win, but you did get two and a half million dollars. Um, how does that change your life? Oh, it was everything. I mean, I went from, you know, outside a two month span I went from never having more than $50,000 to my name to literally being a multimillionaire instantly. Um, it changed everything. It, it changed the course of my kids' lives. Um, it changed. I, it, I finally went, my dad, every time I talked to him, I would always get, Josh, when are you going to get a job? Josh, when are you going to get a job? And I finally changed that. And like my dad was finally proud of his gambler son that he had to go get from the police. And and uh, so, yeah, that was it was it gave me some validity, you know, mixed with the popularity of poker at the time. Um, it uh, it took me out of like the backroom hustler image to instead of being like this look down on poker guy i was the poker guy that everybody saw on tv and um you know parlayed that into a sponsorship with an online site back then and uh it's uh it's really done wonders for me financially and it's allowed me to provide for my kids and have you know a pretty um, I don't want to say lavish, but you know, I've for the past 17 years, you know, money has no longer been an issue, and I've been able to do basically whatever I want. I mean, not uh, over the top like Blazarian style, but you know, <laughs> I, I, I live a great life because of poker. Any uh, big splurges after a huge score like that? Um. No, I, I basically I bought a house in 2004. I paid cash for a house, and I think I bought a Corvette. Uh, but that is was that the a, car that you uh is that the car that you bought from Hank Aaron? No, that was that was a BMW uh, SUV for my ex-wife. Um, yeah, I bought and then but I bought I bought that and then I bought a uh, a Corvette for myself. But you actually got it from Hank Aaron? Yeah, I well, he wasn't the salesperson, but the salesperson, the Hank Aaron was there the day that I bought it, and I went in there and I talked to him for about 15 minutes. He was he was awesome. Like he asked me a million questions about poker and hmm. I was in his office for like 30 minutes. And I'm wanting to ask him so many things cuz I've been a baseball fan my whole life. And being in Atlanta, Hank Aaron's just the man. And I like I couldn't get anything in because he was literally <laughs> asking me poker question after poker question, and it was pretty cool. He was uh, he he understood life. Uh, in my one dealing with him, he made me feel so cool. And uh, that's the one memory that uh, I had with Hank Aaron. It was awesome. Do you think the poker world would be much different if you'd won the main event instead of Reamer? 
Oh, it would be way cooler because I'm so cool. Now, um, <laughs> you know, I don't know. I mean, maybe uh, I maybe not. I, I've never thought about it. Um, I think poker has just been on was on a great path. It had it had the ability for people to play, to come from online, play from their living room and get to the main event. We had that going for us for six years. Uh, I, I don't think it would be any different. Um, I mean, it could be, I've never even had that question. I've never <laughs> thought about it. Um, <laughs> All right. Well, I don't want to keep you late up late tonight thinking about it either. <laughs> uh, I don't want to quote John Mayer, but why Georgia? Um, you know, Atlanta isn't exactly known for casino action. In fact, um, I think Georgia is one yeah. of the least gambling friendly states in the country. Yeah, it's the worst. It's absolutely the worst. Um, I, my dad moved to the U S when my dad had seven brothers and sisters and he moved to the U S by himself. So I grew up with literally, and then my mom left. So I didn't know any of her family. So basically it was me, my brother, my sister, and my dad. I didn't know any family. Uh, my dad's, one of his sisters would come and, and, and stay with us once in a while she was back and forth between the u.s and israel but i wanted to make it a point that my kids grew up around family and because i didn't have any family around growing up um so i felt that if i stayed in georgia my daughter would be able to be around family be her uh her grandma would come often have some cousins here so that's I made the decision to stay in Atlanta for my kids. I didn't want them growing up in Vegas and I didn't want them to grow in, I didn't want them growing up in Vegas not around any family. Uh let's talk about the WSOP. You've always come back and done really well here. Four bracelets now including two this year. Um three in PLO variations. PLO um is this something that you do a lot of work on or is this some one of the games you've always been naturally uh, good at i've been playing plo for a long time um long i, I 25 years how yeah 25 years so it's just very natural to me um i get it i i'm able to pick up on more mistakes um that my opponents make and it allows me to um, target certain players when I when I see a mistake and I realize that somebody's not that good. Uh, I I'm able to pick up on stuff like that and the, the things that I'm not able to pick up on and hold them. Um, so yeah, it's just it's an easier game for me. It's natural. I get it. Um, so. It, I don't know. I just play it better. I don't know why. I just like it better, and I like playing more hands. Um, yeah, no, I don't study. I'm going to study, though, but I don't study. Is this more just tournament format, or do you play a lot of cash as well? Um, when I do play cash, I don't play hardly ever anymore, but when I do play cash, it's PLO. Yeah, I've got, there's got, I got to say, there's got to be something – giving you an edge in these fields because it seems like your your record in this game is among the best um let's talk about uh this year specifically you won the 1500 plo and the 10k plo 8 um what was it about those tournaments that you think got you to the finish line uh there was it was weird there the, the 1500 plo i I like circled that one on the calendar before um, I had come home to hang out with my daughter some. And I told my girlfriend, Rachel, that like, I have to be back for this event. I don't know why, but I just have to be back for this event. And then I came back. I flew in like that tournament started on a Wednesday. I flew in. I flew back to Vegas that morning, ended up winning it. Um and then the 10K PLO 8, uh, I got knocked out of the 50K and registered that. Um, 
And I haven't played much high-low uh, PLO, like very, very little. Uh, but once we got deep, uh, once our stacks got deep, I was able to put a lot of my um, PLO experience uh, to work. And that's, you know, what helped You're me. You're talking about just applying pressure with your stack or no not necessarily but just theory that i have um theory that i play by uh in plo high only um i was able to you know just survive with that and build up a stack using that theory um and you know at the beginning of that tournament i i had just gotten knocked out of the 50k so i wasn't in the best frame of mind and I was kind of just goofing off at the beginning. And then like 30 minutes in, I realized that I had like a three X stack and I was like, Holy crap. Okay. Well, I guess I got to play now. And, uh, <laughs> so yeah, it's just, there's just a lot of real time. I don't know how to explain it, but there's just a lot of real time thought processes that happen in game that I pick up on and I recognize and uh, it it seems to work. I don't know what the right way to say is, but yeah, I just pick up on weird shit that, that I think um, helps me and go from, you know, and, and just continue to build. It's a, a, it was a good win considering you finished third in the 10K PLO in 2017. Yeah. Uh, 2019, you finished runner-up in the $50,000 Poker Players Championship. This year, you finished sixth. Obviously, that's an event that I'm sure you look forward to every year. Uh, yeah, I like competing against the best, and I like... Um, I, I don't know. I put it, this is like the way I explain it. Like people ask me why, why do I think I do good in that tournament? Because I think I've played that tournament like six times and I think I've made it to the final two tables every time, a few times, not cashing. Like sometimes it only, uh, before it, it used to, it used to not be six handed. It used to be eight handed. Um, but there was a few times I think I've, stone bubbled it one year and then one year i was two or three off the bubble but i put it this way i definitely i don't play the limit games near as good as the high limit limit players play but i play it good enough to where i can take advantage of them not playing the big bet games as good so like I'm giving yeah. up a little on the limit games, but I'm making I'm making up the difference in the big bet games. And and I think that somebody like somebody like the grinder whose record in that tournament is unbelievable and he does the same thing where he's he's making up ground. He's not playing the limit games as good, but he's really got a huge edge in the big bet yeah uh explains why he's won it three times um it's you've obviously closed the deal four times at the series you've also finished runner up three times third twice uh you also took second and a third in some wpt events we have a question here um about close calls is there a close call that you still think about or one that really uh, bothered you for a while yeah the the Five diamond at the Bellagio uh, when Daniel I won haunts me because it's I I could have a WBT title as well. Um, we got it all. I had a two to one chip lead and we got it all in. I don't remember if I had queens and he had ace king or if I had ace king and he had queens, but it's one of the two. And I think I had queens and he had ace king because I lost it on the turn. And like an ace came on the turn um but if i win that coin flip you know and and we were playing for at that time we were we were playing for six hundred thousand difference yeah uh, it was uh 1.5 million versus nine hundred and fifty thousand. yeah um so yeah that that 
is probably the one that haunts me the most um, because I had a chip lead and because we got it in on a flip. Um, that you know, it would be cool to have beat Johnny Chan, and I'd have I would have four uh, pot limit Omaha bracelets. Um, but I didn't stand much of a chance with my experience level at the time versus him. I, I didn't have much of a chance, but that would be cool to be able to say, yeah, I beat Johnny Chan head up, uh, for a bracelet. Um, we also, I wanted to talk to you about the POI specifically. Um, how does it feel to beat Bill Hummuth and make him finish second again? <laughs> I think he's finished second like four times now. It's crazy. <laughs> um, I mean, it's it's definitely cooler seeing, you know, me first and then Phil and Daniel second and third. That's pretty cool. It definitely makes it uh, more valid for the non-poker people. Um, but no, I don't. It doesn't really matter. Um, I don't know. I it's. Phil's, so there's uh, no like there's no bragging between the, 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 the you guys right there's no like no, shit no, talking no. somewhere I, no they were both like phil sent me a really nice message congratulating me and daniel did the same and daniel's daniel's helped me so much my whole life um daniel's always been there for me for so many years uh, you know with more than just poker and more than you know, the financial, you know, he's helped me. There was times Daniel backed me for a while when, you know, I wasn't doing too good. And there was, um, you know, I've gone through rough patches in my life where Daniel led me in the right direction. And um, Daniel's just an awesome dude. I mean, he just really is just really good people. And he takes a lot of shit for some of the polarizing stances that he that he makes in life. Um, but when it's all said and done, Daniel is an amazing human. And even with him being so close and, and as much as he wants player of the year, he was truly, truly happy that I won player of the year. Um, so yeah, that, no, there's, there's no shit talking. Um, I mean, there could have been, I mean, it was, <laughs> you know, Phil is, e Phil is an easy person to talk shit to. It's like, he makes it easy. Like Phil throws softballs in the shit talking competition and makes it easy. But no, they, I, I feel like they were both genuinely happy for me. This was, um, really cool for my career highlights. And, uh, I'm, uh, I'm super grateful for both of them. And, uh, I look forward to, you know, improving in all my poker games and uh, maybe, you know, putting myself in. I'm not going to I'm not going to kill myself to try to do this again. But if the situation arises and we're halfway through the month and I'm running good and, and up there on the leaderboard, then, yeah, I'm going to give it a run again. Yeah, your your reign as a player of the year is going to be a lot shorter lived than most people's because <laughs> the series starting so fast, right? We only I got know. four five months to go. I love it though. I mean, I just just the fact that I only have to wait six months to to go get to go battle again um, <laughs> really really is exciting to me. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask you about your mindset towards poker these days. Ten years ago, you told another poker media site that you had retired. From the game, uh, you said, I quote, poker is not what it used to be. Instead of pool room hustlers and gamblers, it turned into freaking geniuses, kids that are making 1600 on the SATs. Yeah, I mean, you I mentioned know, that it, earlier. It still is. No, there's poker is hard. I mean, poker is it's just like everything else. Everything evolves. Like, look at something like the UFC or NBA basketball. You take guys that were the best 15 years ago and there's no way that they can hold anything up to uh, the guys that are good today. Um, so poker and and in order to be good at or to be great at your uh, in your field, you have to really enjoy working at it. And 
I don't enjoy working at it. I don't have time to, I mean, I have time, but I don't want to study for six hours, um, play for another six hours, have groups of people to bounce things off. I, I don't want to do that because I don't enjoy it. Um, I took I, I played poker as a profession. I chose poker as a profession because it was kind of like the easy way out. Um, so, and the, it's, it's not a jab at anybody. And I truly wish that I enjoyed poker the way that some of these younger guys do. Um, because then I could, try to work as hard as they work and they deserve to be the best, uh, because they work at it. Um, but for me now, uh, you know, it's still, I'm still going to play part-time. Like I couldn't believe I was looking at, I was looking at online. Um, people literally flew straight to Florida to play in a 3,500 event at WPT event. And I was shocked at the names of people <laughs> that that just grinded for two months at the World Series and went straight to the Hard Rock to play another event. Um, and it's, you know, hats off to them if they enjoy it that much and they want to work that hard. I, I couldn't do it. There's I just, I couldn't fathom flying to a casino and playing poker right now. Yeah, it takes a special kind of you know, person to be able to read the chart, just not even play, just read the charts <laughs> yeah, day after day yeah, and get enjoyment sure. out of it. You know what I mean? Right. No. And it's like the one thing I actually, my close friend, Daniel Weinman texted me this morning asking me what I thought about um, watching Dylan Weissman's PLO videos. And I'm going to watch him because the kid is a genius um, and the way that he's br he's broken down PLO the way nobody has before. Um, but the thought of doing it right now and I just, <laughs> you know, I just, I need some time. Um, eventually I'll dive in and do a little studying. Um, but yeah, it's poker is, I mean, it's Josh is burned out guys. <laughs> not, not, not burnt out, but I was burnt out before. Like I'm, yeah. I, I'm not going to have it in my life nonstop, you know, with this new job I started, I'm more into poker regularly, um, running pocket fives, but I'm more interested in the business side of it now as I've gotten older than I am actually, you know, winning at the table. Well, let's talk about Pocket Fives. Um, obviously, for those that know, Pocket Fives is uh, the leader in tracking online uh, tournament results. And uh, you're in charge of staking over there, a new staking platform you guys are opening up? Yeah, so um, I started at Pocket Fives in August. And... Um, we decided to do a crowdfunding staking thing with uh, with the site, and it's it, it was a smash at the World Series this year. We had packages from almost every single one of Daniel Negreanu's events. Uh, Phil Helmuth posted a few events. Eric Seidel posted a few events. Um, Felipe Ramos. Uh, I feel bad because I know I'm going to forget a stud. Um, oh my God, Galen Hall, um, Eric Seidel. I don't know if I said him. Um, it was, so this was like, so these were the top players coming in, selling pieces of their action that anybody at home could just buy. Right. Yeah. And, and everybody is at a very, very reasonable markup to where, um, to where, you know, you could possibly make money. There's other sites out there that people are charging high markup and then you're charging there's transaction fees that make every bet a losing proposition. Um, but you know, this was a chance for, for players to engage with their fan base. Um, and it gave their fans a chance to, you know, really have fun watching the updates. People, 
people invested anywhere from five dollars to several thousand dollars on players um but it's uh it, it's i think it's the future of poker and i think that having the fans ability to do this is necessary for poker to grow um if you look at nfl who wants to watch an nfl game if you have no action it's kind of boring but when when you bet ten dollars on a football team now it's a lot of fun and pocket fives brought that to this year's world series for we had over five thousand um new signups uh for for staking and there was certain there was certain packages that over i think one package had 500 different investors jonathan little had had in jonathan little's 100k uh high roller he had over 500 people invest in that one tournament that's uh, super cool yeah jonathan's been uh playing a lot of high rollers lately Good yeah, he's an amazing player. And we also Matt Glantz, Matt Glantz sold 10 percent of his I think. No, Matt Glantz sold 30 percent of his 50K player poker, poker players championship. And it sold out in the, the amount that he was willing to sell sold out in like two hours, which uh, was pretty, pretty cool. Yeah, so the, I guess the goal is to basically, you know, create more engagement with people at home who are just following along absolutely that's we want um we, we just want we want poker to grow and we believe that giving people interest their own interest in their favorite players is the way for us to help grow the game of poker i mean i could envision you know 10 years from now where poker players are kind of treated like certain stocks uh, there's, I mean, right. yeah, I mean, there's no way there's, there's no reason why it shouldn't be that way now. But what our, I think what our job is to build up a statistical database to where we can figure out the correct markup to, to be able to set a par for markup to where when somebody wants to come on and they, they will look at their stats and we tell them, okay, a fair markup for you to sell is this. And um, we want to create a fair marketplace for our, for our customers. And we, but we, at the same time, we want to uh, create uh, a fair tool for players to be able to play events that they've never been able to play before. Yeah, super cool. All right, well, we got some rapid fire questions to wrap things up here if you're ready to go. Oh, let's see here. As long as the blower outside doesn't get us, but I'm ready. <laughs> All right. Um, I read that you are friends with John Smoltz and that you even caddied for him at the U.S. Open qualifier. John is one of the most amazing all-around humans that I've ever been able to be around. For so many years, I've had life questions that I've been able to bounce off him, and he always gives me a really good perspective of criticizing myself and um John's a great person the the most intense competitor I've ever stepped on any, like no matter what it is if it's cards or shooting free throws or golf no matter what it is this guy is an intense competitor and we would we've played so many rounds of golf and we're at each other's throat the entire time and then afterwards we sit down and have dinner and we laugh about the stupidness that we both bring when we're competing um he's john's a awesome awesome guy you must be a pretty good golfer yourself if you could hang with john because he's a great golfer john is a great golfer and I can only hang with John because he gives me a lots of strokes on the <laughs> golf course. What was it like to caddy for him? Oh, it was fun. It's 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 just being around him. It, he is he's just a really good dude, and it was great. Um, usually, when we're on the golf course, we're usually going against each other, you know, trying to crush each other. 
but getting to caddy for him and, you know, being his teammate out there was, uh, we've done it a few times in some U S open qualifiers and, um, we came up short both times, but it was a lot of fun. I, I have a John Smoltz golf story, believe it or not. Um, I was at a charity uh, golf event in Western Florida, a Dan Marino uh, charity event, and John was playing um, in one of the groups behind where I was following. I was following uh, the actor Chris McDonald, who played uh, Shooter McGavin in the Happy Gilmore movies. Okay. (laughs) So I had my priorities straight. Anyway, I was following him and his group uh, from a fairway shot they had just hit. When John teed off behind us, his shot went a little left towards the car path, and me not paying attention, I stepped on his ball, <laughs> oh, Complete, shit. completely implanting it um, in in the mud, the area that had been there, and uh, I ran away. <laughs> I did not wait for I did not wait for punishment. I just ran away. Oh, so no, I'm he sure would, he he wouldn't have he been strolled too. up to a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> he wouldn't have been too rough on you. He really is a good guy. Hopefully they were playing lift clean in place uh, <laughs> that day. Because it was pretty brutal what I did to his, to his lie. Anyway, um, let's see. Rapid fire questions. Um, biggest pot you've ever won or lost? Your choice. Uh, biggest pot I ever won. We were playing 200, 400, no limit at the Bellagio back in 2006, I think, 2006, 2007. I'm playing 200, 400, no limit with uh, Antoine Walker. And oh, cool. I, yeah, I was able to, some, for some reason, I think I was losing in the game and then I just rebought and I had like 108,000 in front of me. And I had two aces and got all in before the flop against two queens. And the door card was an ace. And it was like the easiest (laughs) non-stress $125,000 pot ever. But yeah, I'm pretty sure that that was my biggest pot ever. And you won it off an NBA player. Yeah, Yeah, that's why it's so memorable. (laughs) <laughs> uh you play with a lot of athletes i'm guessing huh um uh not that many um i've played with jordan um wow yeah that was what was that, that experience it was horrible it was he was an asshole he um i don't know it just it just i grew up with i mean just like everybody my age grew up with jordan being the end all you know, the goat, the end. I mean, he's literally the greatest athlete ever. And so you grow up looking up to him. And then a friend of mine called me and said, Hey, you know, do you want to go play golf with Jordan today? And we'll probably play poker afterwards. So we go play golf and it's, it was a miserable experience. There was probably 15 carts of people following us around, you know, everybody's Everybody who was playing told their buddies about it, and they were all watching, and um, it was a horrible experience. He was just like this big, over-the-top alpha male that knew he was better than everybody else. Or, I don't know. But but then we went and played poker, and that was more of my element, so I thought it was going to be different, but it wasn't. It's like the stupid jokes kept coming. Um, every time he says anything – that's not remotely funny. The whole whole place erupts in laughter, and it just it was a horrible experience that um, I didn't enjoy a bit. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Did you have you ever played with Scottie Pippen? He might be. <laughs> no, I've never. <laughs> he played. might be more um, uh, more commiserating with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I've never played with I've never played with Pippen. Um, I don't know. I can't think. Uh, I mean, that's a pretty big pull already. Yeah, I think I played some Chinese poker with, uh, with, um, with Brian Erlacher. Um, I played, oh, Chipper Jones. I played a lot of cards with. He's a good dude. He's, he lives here in Atlanta and I've been around him a lot. He used to live in my old neighborhood. And, uh, 
Yeah, I don't know. I can't think of others. Man, I forgot. It's a good year to be a Braves fan, too. Yeah, that was awesome. It was We were playing the 50K, and I was just in shock just watching the big screen. It was so freaking cool. <laughs> uh, best swap or piece you've ever had of anybody? Um, Definitely Sean Deeb. Sean's fucking stud. He's I, nobody, I, not that I can think of, but Sean's definitely the only other person. I, I have a really bad track record with swapping where it feels like I'm always paying people, but Sean is a stud. <laughs> He's come through for you a few times, huh? Yeah, more than once. He's Sean's, Sean's unbelievable how, how, well, that guy understands tournaments and what he does when he gets a pile of chips is freaking insane. Uh, weirdest place you've ever played poker for money? Oh, weirdest place I've ever played poker for money. Um, I was reading that you were playing uh, in some warehouse in Atlanta at one point. Oh, that's normal. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, we, I don't know, man, I've played poker for money everywhere. Like we've used, like, I mean, there's been times where we literally use peanuts as chips and, um, like hundred, like using a peanut for like a hundred dollar chip and <laughs> man, I've played poker everywhere. Like we've played poker on hotel room beds we've played poker in like cafes just while they're open i've played poker in the back of a pawn shop i've played poker in the basement of a uh arcade like video game warehouse um dude i've played uh, we i've played <laughs> everywhere uh longest session and how did it go? Oh, God. Um, probably 72 hours. <laughs> um, I used to, when I was younger, I used to play really long sessions. Um, and they usually go good because I will go broke before a long session. So if I was playing a long session, it means that I'm doing good. I usually don't like to get uh, – I, I don't like to mix losing with being tired. Uh, I think that the adrenaline of winning can carry you through uh, into the long hours. Um, so usually my long sessions are involve winning. What was your largest non-poker wager? Um, um, I, it's got to be pool against JRB. <laughs> the, the, the aforementioned I, betting a car every game. <laughs> yeah, I'm not gonna put a I'm not gonna put a dollar sign with it, but yeah, it's definitely pool against JRB. Uh, do you have a celebrity doppelganger, or have people told you you look like somebody? <laughs> um, yeah, the uh, Smoltz always calls me Angel Cabrera. Oh my god! I don't even have to look it up, and I can already see it. <laughs> uh, he calls me That's a, hilarious. A short, a short Angel Cabrera. You know, Angel is looking a little old these days. Uh, I'd have to go back a few years for the, for yeah, the match, but yeah, yeah for yeah, sure. When he won the Masters like six or seven years ago. Man, he's also put on a few pounds too. Uh, you, you're looking more svelte these days than he has, but I could definitely <laughs> see it for sure. <laughs> That's funny. Um, somebody, all right. Somebody, somebody the other day sent me a something like the Iron Man guy said that I look like the guy in Iron Man, and I was like, wow, that that dude's kind of good looking. So maybe uh, let's go with that talk, instead of talking Cabrera. about Robert Downey Jr. No, who was it? Maybe it you, was you're, you're talking about the Iron Man. Yeah, the Iron Man. It was like I guess something with the glasses that I wear or something. Yeah, I could see a little bit of Robert Downey Jr. in here for sure. Um, all right, what is your most prized possession? 
material. Sure. Um, I think it's got to be my first bracelet if it's material things. Well, we actually ask, where do you keep your bracelets? Do you have like uh, a display in, or? No, they're, they're in a safety deposit box, but I think we're thinking about doing a big display with a bunch of pictures from this year and, you know, a bunch of news clippings and doing like a collage and then having uh, the the two bracelets put in there. But yeah, my bracelets were in, they're in a safety deposit box. Uh, over the years, did you ever have a nemesis, somebody you couldn't beat or somebody that just held over you? Not that I can think of. I, I dude, literally like I'm, I'm so um, overly optimistic in almost like a gullible way that <laughs> and, and I live life with the with the thought that I'm literally the luckiest person. Um, so I, I just never, ever, when I'm at the poker table, I just don't feel like there's ever going to be somebody that is going to hold over. Me. Uh, I just feel like that I'm going to get lucky. I just, I've always thought that way. Yes. There's Are some great, sure? there's some great players out there that I struggle with, but as far as, you know, holding over me, I just. No, I, there's nobody that's going to get as lucky as me in in a time of need. Are you superstitious at all? Not overly. I mean, there's a few things that like I'll laugh at myself about, but um, no, I'm I'm not really superstitious. I don't do any stupid things that I think are going to bring me luck. Um, I don't know. I'll pray to <laughs> Jewish baby Jesus. I don't know. No, I, don't. <laughs> I don't know. Me and my girlfriend always joke around about JBJ, but uh, <laughs> um, no, I'm not superstitious. Uh, do you have a favorite movie? Uh, I have a few. Like, like Remember the Titans, I can't not watch when it comes on. And I, I really like Coach Carter. Um, I really like Step Brothers. I don't know. I a lot of movies that I like. I don't know. Uh, those, yeah. I guess if I had to pick one movie, it would have to be Remember the Titans. That was three solid choices right there. Um, biggest pet peeve at the table. Um, being mean to dealers. That really pisses me off and i uh i think it's absolutely horrible when some rich poker player sits down at a table and is mean to a dealer that's working their fucking ass off to make a average living and it really 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 pisses me off yeah, I, I myself, I get very uh, overprotective of people who are blaming their bad luck on dealers for sure. But uh, yeah, it's not just or bad. Play. It's just it's just it's just hor. I mean, it's just horrible. Like it's just think about it for a second. You're sitting here playing cards because you choose to, and you can make a lot of freaking money at the end of the day if if the cards go the right way, and this dealer, you don't know what they're dealing with in their regular life. They're working their ass off 12, 14 hour shifts and you're going to be a fucking asshole. I mean, it's just, it's just horrible. It, it, that is my main, like my number. If you go, if you talk about pet peeves at the table, like that is my number one through 20. And then there <laughs> might be some other little things, but but if you can't respect the dealer, then uh, you're just – just go fuck yourself. I mean it's just basically, yeah, that's it. There you have it. We have three more quick ones, and then I'll let you go. Uh, if you could call up anyone in the world and have a one-hour conversation, who would you call? Oh, my gosh. Um, Gary V. Sue? Who? Gary, 
Gary V. Do you know who that is? Oh, the uh, okay, Gary V. Okay, I've seen Entre- his videos Entre- pop up on my Facebook. Entrepreneur, like uh, he's an entrepreneur. He's uh, Van Vanderchuk. Van yeah. Der- yeah. Um, I, I think that he gets it. Like he just gets life. Um, I think that our thought, our thought processes are his brain ticks very similar to mine where he's always thinking about making money. Um, it would be really cool to just get some, an outlook on life. Um, you know, to, you know, just to pick his brain, he seems to get it. We're talking about, uh, not only the business side of things, but he, he's, he cares about people and he, and, and he, I, I just, I think that he gets life and, and he's very successful in what he does. Yeah. I happened to stumble upon a video of him talking about, uh, giving his kids more screen time rather than less. Um, yeah, I mean, because that's, like, because that's the way the world's headed or whatever. Yeah. There's, there was, there's one of the videos that he, that he has, um, really stands out to me. And it's about when he was, uh, or something about like a teacher calling him into the, in to have a meeting at school because his kid said the word shit. And, um, when, you know, Miss Parker or whatever, if, if it bothers you so much that, and you think it's going to change this person's life because they said the word shit, we just have different outlooks on life. They, yeah. I, I want to express verbally the way that I think. And for me to be genuine, I have to say the word shit because that's the way my brain is telling my mouth. That's what my brain is telling my mouth without me going and saying crap. Um, and it just, he, it that one video just stands out because it's like I don't think that my kids saying shit is going to keep them from any opportunity that might that might come across them and they're not going to not have that opportunity because they spoke genuinely in from their brain to their mouth. Right, right, right. How how can you fault somebody who drops something on their toe and has an involuntary response? Right, right. <laughs> Let alone punish them. Um, let's see. If you could pick one, or if you could name the entertainment for the Super Bowl halftime show, what would you choose? Oh my gosh, I'm too embarrassed. <laughs> I can't. What do you mean? Um, the entertainment for the. Ugh. How embarrassing could it be? Um, I would probably pick about. It would be a mixed. It would be like ten different artists. Um, all doing like one song, like it would be like Eminem is on stage for a song and U2 is on there for a song and just a bunch of nineties, you know, early two thousands and just, it wouldn't be one artist. It would be like 10 different artists playing their most prized hit. All right, so like a heal the world situation. Everyone comes yeah. together. And- well, <laughs> <laughs> not, not necessarily we are the world, but yeah, I mean, it would be, it would, I can't stand, I, I get bored like seeing one person, I mean, just continue to do a bunch of different songs. I want one guy to go out there and do his one song the best he can. And then I want somebody else to come out there and do the one song the best that they can. <laughs> I know, whoever, <laughs> everyone plays their best hit and then gets yeah, off the stage last, last year's super bowl show was really cool it was like the one it was the weekend and it was like the one time that i really enjoyed the uh the halftime show it there was a go. hell of a show. all right we end the podcast the same way every time with a question from the random question generator here we go <laughs> What's the most ridiculous thing you have ever bought? Oh God. Um, if you don't have a good answer, I could I could spin the wheel again. Um, it's got to be. I have a lot of baseball cards that okay that 
I keep thinking I'm going to come across something with some value. But the thing that makes it the most ridiculous that I get made fun of the most about is that I'm never going to sell any of them. So what's the difference? <laughs> like, it doesn't matter right. how good a card is. I'm never going to sell it. So, yeah, I think my ridiculous number of baseball cards could be the dumbest. Um, but Jared Blesnick is listening right now, just so angry that you said that. Uh, no, it's yeah. I spent a lot of money there this year and got a bunch of shit. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I I I don't really splurge that often. Um, I don't I don't have a lot of expensive things. I, you know, when I I guess when I was younger, I mean the Corvette. I would never buy another Corvette. It was that was a stupid waste of money. Um, but yeah, no, I I don't buy. Expensive thing. Can you think of anything? You don't have like a, a, a Segway collecting dust in the garage? Oh, no, I don't. <laughs> um, no, I have. No, I don't. <laughs> I don't waste. I, I don't. Not that I don't waste money. I do. I mean, I I buy nice stuff and I have nice things, but I all stuff. That nothing I ridiculous. Need. Yeah, no. Nothing all right. Ridiculous. So let's end it by telling us your favorite card then in your collection. Oh, that's the thing is I don't even know. I mean, it's like, I don't, I literally, I don't even know. Um, I guess I know I, an Ozzy Smith rookie, maybe that's cool. Which is, which isn't even worth that much. Yeah. Ozzy Smith was like my favorite player growing up and Mr. Backflip. Yeah. I was the, like the little short pudgy kid that wanted to do the backflips going out there, but I couldn't, um, but yeah, Ozzy Smith. I lo- it was he was definitely uh, just the way he played defense was way ahead of his time, and it was I uh, I was always a decent hitter, but never great. But uh, so I prided myself on uh, on playing good defense. There you go, Josh. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast and sharing the stories. Thank you, man. I enjoyed it. That's it. That is the show. Thank you once again to Josh for taking the time. Go tell him how much you like the show on Twitter, where you can find him at Golfer Josh. You can also check out his brand new staking platform, now available on PocketFives.com, which is also a great poker site that specializes in online tournament play. Of course, you can always find us at Card Player Media and also at Poker underscore Stories on Twitter. If you like what you heard, please subscribe. And if you do go the extra mile with a five-star rating and review, Let us know you did so with an email to PokerStories at CardPlayer.com and we'll hook you up with a free digital subscription to CardPlayer Magazine. Thanks for listening.